All right, today's lesson is about the Seven Years' War here in America. It's known as the French and Indian War, okay? This is a very, very important step along the way for us to become uh, an independent nation. Uh, the colonists were heavily involved with this war on the side of the British, uh, and this war would ultimately lead to further conflict between the colonists and the British, which we all know would eventually lead to us becoming an independent nation. First things first, why is it called the Seven Years' War in some places in the French and Indian War here in the United States? Well, the reason is because the Seven Years' War in Europe is considered to be part of a much broader world-staged conflict where it's almost like a, the First World War, where you had nations from all over Europe involved. Here in America, we've, we call it the French and Indian War because we really focus on the conflict that happened here in the United States, which, of course, was the British and the colonists versus the French and a coalition of Native American groups. So if you look at this map right here, this, this is, uh, shows you how broad this conflict actually was. Every single thing that you see here that is blue, all over the world, Africa, here in Africa, um, here in South America, this is a Portuguese territory, the Portuguese were involved with this war, um, all the way into Asia, you have British allies, okay? So this is England right here, I'm circling it, right there, and that's the homeland of the British. But everything that you see here in blue are allies of the British, and they assisted them in this war. On top of that, you have a large French coalition, okay? This French coalition is everything that you see here in green. Now, this is, a, once again, a huge war that involves all kinds of world powers. Everything that you see here in South America and Central America that is green, these are all Spanish colonies. So the Spanish came into the war on the side of the French. You even have places like Russia up here. You have Scandinavia. Okay, you have Finland. You have Sweden there. Um, you even have the Philippines over here, which is part of uh, the French greater co colonies. Now this right here is France. I'm putting lines through France. So this is the French homeland right here. So why is it the Seven Years' War? Well, there it is. There's a lot more fighting than what, what we just see here in the United States. However, for the French and Indian War, that's this area here that involves the colonists and the frontier. This area right here is where most of the fighting occurred up and around the Great Lakes. Um, and this area is known as the Ohio River Valley. So I guess the question is, why did this war occur in the first place? Before we get to that, here's a sweet picture of the French and Indian War. Can't go wrong there. So, like I said, the, the, the war was, was fought between the British and the French. And, and I really need to stress to you how much the British and the French disliked each other. They had been in constant conflict for roughly 100 years on and off. And it, it really led to uh, just ultimate bad blood between these two nations. And so before we start talk about what caused this war, let's talk about what war would have looked like in the 1750s and 1760s when this war took place. Uh, the war actually started technically in 1754 and ended in 1763. So this, this type of warfare during this time frame was much different than what you would see today. And one of the biggest differences, as you can see, would be what you wore. Um, this is a British soldier. They were also known as redcoats. During the Revolution, the Patriots referred to them as lobster backs because, of course, lobsters are red whenever you cook them. And then over here, you have the French wearing bright blue. Now, most of you are probably thinking that doesn't seem like a very wise thing to wear if you're going into battle. Don't you not want to be seen by your enemy? Well, warfare was much different. Um, European-style warfare basically was you would array your your soldiers across the battlefield and they would then shoot at each other with their muskets in volleys. So they would literally just fire back and forth at each other. Wildly and accurately, you would just shoot towards the other and the enemy line. And if you hit something great, but you, you often would miss because these weapons that they use right here, I'm going to circle it. Okay, this is a British musket. Okay, now a musket is a, is, a, is a very deadly weapon, but at the same time, I want to stress to you how poor of a weapon it is compared to what we think of a, as a gun today. The biggest difference is a musket takes about a minute to load, so firing it is a very slow process. And on top of that, 
uh, muskets don't have rifling down their barrel. Now, what rifling does is it makes it so whatever you shoot out of your gun has a spin to it. Kind of like, think of a football, like a spiral on a football, all right? And what that rifling does in the spinning of whatever you shoot out of your gun, whether it be a, a mini ball or a musket ball or whatever, makes it so your shot's much more accurate. Um, you know, think of a knuckleball pitcher. Uh, what makes a knuckleball pitcher very difficult to hit a, a ball with is because there's no spin on the ball. And so the ball can take wild turns in the, in the, in the middle because there's no control with the spin to keep it on track. A lot fewer people died in warfare at this time in history. The numbers are not nearly as staggering. And of course, we have modern warfare has much deadlier weapons. Um, but I don't want to downplay the brutality of war at any point in history, regardless of the death count. You know, after you would fire at each other, you would then have a bayonet charge. Now, this right here is a bayonet. This is, for lack of a better way of thinking about it, it's just a knife that you attach to the end of a gun. And a bayonet charge is a very brutal thing because you're literally fighting hand to hand where you have to be close enough to see the face and the whites of the eyes of the person that you're killing. And you have to physically plunge uh, the, the bayonet into their body. So I don't want to like downplay the brutality of it, even though the death count in these types of wars was much lower than today. In the middle, you see the American Indians. Okay, The American Indians fought primarily for the French. Um, and there's a good reason for that. Uh, the French and the Native Americans had been very much uh, successful and peaceful trading partners in the Ohio River Valley, where this war took place. They um, had a, a level of respect that they had earned from each other. Uh, the French basically treated Native Americans as equals, as trading partners and had made a lot of money uh, working in conjunction with Native Americans, trading primarily weapons for, I will show you, an interesting commodity which the British wanted to get their hands on. The British, on the other hand, saw Native Americans for, for in large part as inferiors, as savages, and they really weren't interested in creating trade partnerships with Native Americans so much as they were interested in taking the land and settling upon the land of Native Americans, which you can imagine would have a much different, um, you know, view. Now, whenever you take notes on this, all I want you to do is pause the video. I'm going to keep on going, but if you need to pause the video and make sure you write the notes into your notebook like you normally would. There it is. The commodity that the French and the British were fighting for. Yes, folks, it is a beaver. Now, what is so special about this little creature that builds these awesome little dams and lives in rivers? Um, what about them is so fantastic? Well, it's their hair, of course. Beaver pelts. Now, then the next question is, well, what do you make out of beaver pelts that's so valuable that you could make like modern day millions and millions of dollars on? Well, hats. But you think of that hat, that guy's wearing a beaver hat. You think, oh, well, well I don't remember that being a popular hat style I've ever seen. Well, it's because it isn't. Uh, they would take the beaver pelts and they would change into this. They wouldn't use beaver fur. They would use beaver fur to make beaver felt. So this is a felt hat. And the beauty of using beaver to make felt hats is it's warm. So if it's cold outside, you've got your head covered, you're nice and cozy, and it's waterproof. But most importantly, it's super versatile in the sense that you can make any shape of hat out of beaver felt. Okay, so this is your classic top hat, but all kinds of hats could be made using beaver felt. And, you know, beaver pelt hats and beaver felt hats were popular not just during the 1750s and 60s. Um, the popularity of that type of hat would endure for centuries. I mean, all you have to do is look at the famous hat that Abraham Lincoln wore. What do you think that was made of? Of course, beaver felt. So France and the Ohio River Valley, the French had, like I said, for quite some time, made a successful trading partnership with Native Americans. Um, they controlled virtually all the land west of the Appalachian Mountains, and I'll show you that on the map here in a second. Um, and the way they controlled this land was a very interesting way because the Ohio River Valley at this point in history, I want to stress to you, is a massive, unbroken forest. It's wilderness upon wilderness upon wilderness. There are no roads. 
there are no ways to get a wagon from point A to point B in, in this area. Um, it's super hilly and super duper mountain or super duper uh, wooded. So it's very difficult to travel in this terrain. So the way the French controlled the Ohio River Valley wasn't by creating settlements and trade routes. It was basically building forts on waterways. Waterways would really become the highways of how trading occurred in the Ohio River Valley because you had the ability to easily transport boatloads of beaver pelts out to the ocean and then get them back to Europe in a very, very efficient way. And the French would control those waterways by building forts along them. Those forts acted as gatekeepers. They, anyone that passed by that fort had to be approved by whatever French commander was at that, at that fort. And so the French Indian War would become a, a war fought to control forts along the, the riverways. Okay, pause it if you need to, write down the notes, and then move on. So this is the Ohio River Basin. The Ohio River Basin is the area that, that the uh, French and Indian War was fought in. There was battling up here on the Great Lakes and even up here into what would be modern day Canada. But for the most part, this is where all the fighting occurred. Now, it's to control the Ohio River Basin. The Ohio River Basin is where the Ohio River exists. Now, the Ohio River starts basically right here in western Pennsylvania. It goes down here. It's actually the border between several states here. And then it goes into the Queen River of the United States, right here, the Mississippi River. So the Ohio River is a pretty major river system. In fact, it's fed by two different rivers. There's one right here that's called the Monongahela, and another river up here, this one's called the Allegheny River. Now these rivers empty right here into the Ohio River Valley. So this circle right here would become one of the most important strategic spots to control, to control the fur trade, because you control three rivers at once. These are the Appalachian Mountains right here. For the most part, the American colonies were east of the Appalachian Mountains. And you have the Appalachian Mountains as a barrier between the colonies and French territory. But slowly but surely, American colonists, who of course were British, uh, because this was actually British colonies, we weren't independent yet, slowly moved into the Ohio River Basin. So there's kind of an inevitable conflict that's being built here between the French and the British. And of course, the lucrative fur trade cannot be understated. This is what it looks like. This is a picture of the Ohio River uh, Valley. Um, and this is what it looks like through that whole entire area. It's very hilly, like you're walking up a hill or down a hill. You're not walking any flatland. There's very little flatland to be had. It's very, very, very wooded. I mean, this was a massive, unbroken, deciduous forest. And as you can see, you have the rivers going through it. That's the way you control the fur trade. And this is a fort. This is, of course, a replica. Um, there's many replicas of these forts all over uh, in this area. You, you can go look at them. They're basically living museums. But this is typical of what a fort would look like. Um, a wooden fort, what is what you have available to you? Um, and you would see these dotting the landscapes. And these were the this is where the, most of the battles happened, in and around these forts. So like I said, the English began settling over the Appalachians, and that sets up conflict. The French were determined to stop the English expansion into their territory. And, you know, at the same time, the English were determined to kind of chip away at the French uh, control of the Ohio River Valley. So a huge part of this war was the war with the Native Americans. Um, the Native Americans, like I said, primarily fought on the side of the French, but the British did have Native American allies. So they chose uh, sides and basically... The Native Americans weren't fighting this war to gain any kind of economic uh, power from or for the British or the French. Their main focus was to maintain their way of life, to maintain their culture, and to maintain their ancestral lands. And the Native American tribes who chose sides used, basically looked at that as their primary reason for choosing a side. Um, the British would promise to give this tribe or that tribe um, X amount of land and to let them maintain their way of life on that land. And the French essentially did the same thing. Um, in the end, the Iroquois and Mohican tribes fought for the British. 
the Mohawk and Huron fought for the France in France. And this is just a couple of the tribes. I want to stress to you, there's many other tribes that were involved with this conflict. And once again, the vast majority fought for France. This is a typical Native American. We talked about diversity of Native Americans, how they're not all the same. And we always typically think of Plains Indians like the Sioux or the Lakota as being your typical uh, Native American. Well, these right here, th these are Huron Indians. Um, they are very different in culture, language, um, completely different from uh, your typical classic Native American Hollywood created version. Fighting in this massive unbroken wilderness would have been a challenge for anybody. The advantage the Native Americans had was knowing the territory and they did not fight the same way as the British or the French for that matter. The British and the French had this European idea of combat where you line up, you fire at each other across the field and it's a back and forth until someone eventually wins or loses. It, it's, it's not at all how Native Americans fought. They used an ambush technique. Okay, They would pop out they would fire and they would meld back into the forest and live to fight another day. Um, because of this, the, the Native Americans were absolutely critical. Okay, this is Robert Dinwiddie. Robert Dinwiddie was the governor of the colony of Virginia. And he is really the primary cause of the British fighting against the French in the French and Indian War. He kind of tips off the war, so to speak. He orders a young 21-year-old lieutenant colonel to take a small contingent of men into the wilderness, into the Ohio River Valley for the purpose of to basically reclaim a particular fort that the French had built. So the French had built a fort up on Lake Erie um, on this place called Presque Isle and another fort nearby called Fort LaBeouf. The French building these forts, he saw the French building these forts as an intrusion into their trade routes, into their territory. This young British commander is someone who is very familiar to all of you. His name is George Washington. This is what we think of when we think of George Washington. Okay, this is a portrait painted by George Washington when he was president. Okay, he was president much, much, much later in time than when he was a young commander. And one thing that I think is an important aspect of this is the fact that George Washington would learn how to be a good commander during the French and Indian War, and he would apply that knowledge eventually against the British as the supreme commander of the American forces, the Continental Army, in the Revolutionary War. But everyone starts somewhere. Nobody's perfect. We like to think of our founding fathers as these perfect individuals who created this wonderful nation that we all live in. However, that's not the case in 1754 when uh, George Washington had his first conflict, his first time that he saw combat. Um, he made some massive errors, but those errors were critical in the sense that they taught him how to do things the right way as a kid. This man right here is named Tana Carson. He is the chief of a Seneca tribe that's part of the Iroquois Confederacy. The Iroquois Confederacy was allied with the British in the French and Indian War. Uh, when uh, Robert Dinwiddie ordered George Washington to seek out the surrender of the French forts on Presque Isle and Fort LaBeouf, uh, he sent George Washington blindly into the wilderness. He had no idea where he was going. However, he had the help of this man, Tana Carson, to help him navigate through this huge, massive uh, forest. Um, he also was known as the Half King. And I'll refer to him as that from here on out. So the half king is escorting George Washington through the wilderness. And they come upon a contingent of, of French scouts. Uh, it's a small group of scouts. We're talking 18 men. And George Washington has a small contingent of men along with Tana Carson's men or the half king's men. They surprise attacked this French contingency early in the morning. War had not been declared yet. But this really would lead to the official declaration of war. So a lot of people would say that the French Indian War was single-handedly started by George Washington being a young commander making the mistake of firing on what essentially is a, a nation at peace with them. And uh, that, that is all up for great debate. But the bottom line, the first shots were fired by George Washington in this battle, in this war. So George Washington surprise attacks this group of scouts early in the morning and uh, 
some very interesting events take place shortly thereafter because the, the leader of this group, his name is Joseph Calon de Jonville, and he was taken captive. Uh, he wasn't killed in the initial uh, ambush attack. Um, and this story is up for some dispute. There is no 100%. But according to accounts, the half king said, thou, thou art not yet dead, my father. And he walks up to Joseph Calon de Jonville and he puts his tomahawk right into his skull and he cracks open his head and he takes his hands, puts it inside of the skull of Jumonville and washes his hands inside of his brains. He then pulls his hands out and eats a portion of Jumonville's brains in front of a horrified George Washington. You could imagine how unbelievably shocked you would be seeing such a scene. Um, we don't know why the half king did this, uh, but the best guess we have is that the half king was kidnapped as a young man by the French. And in French captivity, there's no question that something happened that bred into him a deep and abiding hatred of the French. At any rate, George Washington unsuccessfully tries to negotiate the the surrender of Fort, Fort uh, LeBeouf and, and Fort Presque Isle. And of course, that's because of the hostilities. It's very difficult to negotiate in good faith to have the removal of, a, of another nation while at the same time killing their soldiers. So the first shots were in 1754. The next year, um, George Washington was ordered to help build a fort at the confluence of the Mongahela, Allegheny, and Ohio rivers. Okay, so like I said earlier on in the slideshow, that's a very important area because you control three rivers with one fort. Um, when George Washington got to that spot where the Monongahela, Allegheny, and Ohio rivers meet, there was already a French fort built there. Okay, it was called Fort Duquesne. And in one of the greatest blunders, probably the greatest blunder in George Washington's military career, he ordered a full frontal assault of that fort. This was a huge mistake. He basically sent all of his men to their death, and it was a complete and total bloodbath. And in the process, George Washington was also taken captive and held by the French for over a month. The first part of the French and Indian War was an absolute terrible like disaster for the British. Um, George Washington had shown very little success in the field. Um, George Washington, the, the, the British, after the initial hostilities with George Washington's much smaller force, sent over a large force of British um, under the leadership of a, of a general called Edward Braddock. And it was an absolute total disaster. Um, the French won uh, several sweeping victories, and but eventually this war would end up uh, as a British victory, but at a huge cost. And the tide turned when a man named William Pitt took over as prime minister in England. And William Pitt had basically decided that the way to win this broader conflict that, remember, is going on all over the world is to focus their attention squarely and specifically in the Americas. And... He leveraged all of the wealthy investors that he possibly could and got enough money to, to fund a huge surge in this war in America. That came at a high cost, though. Um, eventually, Britain would find themselves in financial dire straits because of the debt that they incurred during the French and Indian War. But it was William Pitt that turned the tide of this war. This is an image of the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, which was fought in the dead of winter outside of the modern day city of Quebec, Canada. Um, the Battle of the Plains of, Ab Plains of Abraham is an area, of a large flat area outside of the city. In the Battle of Plains of Abraham, uh, both commanders were actually mortally wounded during the hostilities. And this image that you're seeing right here is an image of the, the leader of the British contingent who was a brilliant commander named James Wolfe. He is right here laying on the ground, mortally wounded right here. Um, and then this Native American here, apparently he's just chilling out, hanging out with them. Kind of a funny picture. Um, on the French side, uh, their great commander, who was also a very talented and great commander in and of himself, his name was 
Marquis Louis Montcalm. Um, he was also mortally wounded in this battle. So in the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, it's a classic story of a British ambush. Now, this is like one of the last great strongholds of the French. The British had poured tons of money and effort into the war and had taken many forts back from the French and built new forts of their own. But the Battle of the Plains of Abraham was, was a, a morning ambush. Now, the Plains of Abraham has this large cliff-like edge Right here, down here, is the St. Lawrence River, okay, which is a major waterway. Once again, forts control waterways. Early in the morning, we're talking before it's light out, in the dark, the British sail quietly up the St. Lawrence River. They scale this cliff, which the French consider to be like a natural barrier. No one's going to climb up that. Well, the British did. And early in the morning... In the early morning mist, uh, the British emerge out of nowhere, capturing the French completely off guard. Like literally in the morning, once light comes and the fog lifts, there is a massive British army arrayed in front of the unprepared French. It was a very bloody and very, very dramatic conflict. But in the end, that surprise move that was the plan of James Wolfe made it so that they could win this battle. There's a picture of the battle of the Plains of Abraham right now. Okay, this is the Plains of Abraham. Behind it is a city called Quebec. And you can see how right here in this water you have this essentially it's almost like a cliff. It's a very, very steep cliff. Okay. And they were able to scale that cliff and surprise the French. In the end, the British won that great victory, which in the end we also won the war. And in 1763, in the city of Paris, the British and the French and their allies got together and basically split up, made a deal. Who gets what now? The British, having won the war, um, took pretty much all French claims to North America, except they allowed the French to maintain control of a few Caribbean islands because that's where the, they primarily had all their uh, sugar plantations and the British were, were kind enough to allow the French to maintain control of those. Spain had got in on the war on the side of France right at the end of the war. And that's considered to be one of the great blunders that the Spanish had made. Um, the Spanish got in on a, a losing war right at the end. And in the process, in the Treaty of Paris 1763, they had lost Florida. Florida was once a Spanish territory. Now it became a British territory. Um, but they had gained the Louisiana Territory. Now, Louisiana Territory is, a, is pretty much the entire Midwest of the United States, stretching from Louisiana all the way up into South Dakota and Montana. So in the end, England was the big winner. They got control over the Ohio River Valley. Um, they took control of Florida and had taken, kicked France out of all of, the, all of Canada. So England was the big winner. Um, they were able to take Florida, they got the Ohio River Valley, and the French were also removed from all of Canada. And so the British gained a massive amount of territory and resources from this war. However, it came at a hugely heavy cost. Uh, William Pitt putting a, a ridiculous amount of money and driving England into deep debt to win this war uh, would leave England in a terrible position. So here's the question. Who's going to pay for it? Now, this really sets up the Revolutionary War. England has a huge bill to pay. And they decide that America, the colonists, having gained all that territory for them to be able to use and exploit, owed. And the colonists, of course, said, not us. We are not paying for this. So, ah, here we go. The Revolutionary War, the stage has now been set.